California flower growers transform their land into absolute beauty with a fragrance to match. But don't let this idyllic scene lull you into thinking that this is the business for you. Currently, more than 85% of the flowers consumed in the United States come from a foreign country, versus in the 70s, it was basically 0%. Growers are fighting to hold on to that last 15%, a share that still adds up to a $10 billion a year industry in California. Today, the focus is on flowers that South Americans can't grow as well, like orchids, lilies, and gerberas. The biggest region in the state for growing cut flowers is the Santa Barbara area where Van Wigerden's Westland Floral is located. How many plants? Yeah. We, we plant about 50,000 plants per acre. They distribute bouquets to stores all across the country. U.S. cut flower producers have one of the smallest profit margins in agriculture. It does not look good for uh, being a cut flower producer in the United States. According to Van Wigerden, carnations, chrysanthemums, and baby's breath are, for the most part, no longer grown commercially in the U.S because foreign countries have cheaper labor costs and nearly perfect weather for growing flowers. And we are close to the, to the uh, American market that helps us currently to be a viable source still, but we are having difficulty staying profitable. California growers have relied on efficiency and new technology to stay afloat. Perhaps the biggest source of that knowledge is UC Davis, okay. where leading plant scientists yeah. are working shoulder to shoulder with a wide range of growers. The California cut flower industry also includes container plants. Here at Half Moon Bay, the Nurseryman's Exchange grows more than 300 varieties of plants for the home and garden. And they say the technological advancements have enabled them to grow stronger plants that last longer. How can we survive without doing the right practices with water? You cannot. How can you survive if you cannot control your pests? You cannot. You know, if you can't grow the plant in a certain amount of time, you will not survive. If you don't have good shelf life for the consumer where they have a good result, you cannot survive. Every penny of production has to be monitored for our success. Both Pearlstein and Van Wigerden owe a sense of gratitude to UC Davis researchers who provide them with tools to deal with such things as insects, viruses, and post-harvest challenges. Michael Reed, an environmental horticulturalist, has been working with industry leaders for more than three decades. So UC Davis has had a strong program in ornamentals in the post-harvest and production and pest management uh, for many years and the industry has really relied on that. Well, I think without the work from UC Davis and its team of scientists, I'm not sure that Nurseryman's Exchange would still be in existence as we know it. Yeah, and I, I think, you know... Virtually all cut flowers and container plants are grown in massive greenhouses. UC Davis's Heiner Leith says these growing chambers are high-tech. Every factor is controlled with a computer, with sensors, with technology. Flowers grown today are nearly perfect thanks to protected cultivation that these greenhouses provide. With every little tool that we get, we get more power, we get more efficiency, and we bring the price down. We bring the price of production down. So everything that we can do to help take uncertainty out of it, to take variability out of it, will be a benefit to the grower. And every benefit to a grower is measured in terms of economic benefit. Up to 18,000 bouquets are produced every day on this assembly line at Westland Floral. These bouquets can be purchased from grocery stores for as little as $10. For commercial growers, it all begins here, creating a substrate so that the plant can grow quick and healthy. Computers control the soil mixes and add the right combination of minerals to the water. There is no grower right now that is not using the UC system for producing container-grown plants. It is the standard in the world. So we can get every one of these plants to result in a marketable plant of perfect quality. You cannot do that with soil. If you were to put soil in this container, half of these plants and would be dead. And substrate is made up of what? This particular substrate is made up of, uh, it has sand in it, it has some redwood sawdust in it, it has some peat moss in it, and it has these proportions at a very engineered uh, set of ratios. Another major challenge for greenhouse production is dealing responsibly with insects. Any bug seems to get resisted at some point. So that just continues to be our challenge to be able to come up with materials that we can uh, do a better job in maintaining our, our pest populations in, in the plants. Almost all commercial growers credit the research work of Michael Perella, a world-renowned UC Davis expert 
on the development of integrated pest management strategies for ornamental plants. There can be technology developed, and we've done a lot of that here, to make sure that if they use a pesticide, they choose the right one, they use it properly, they monitor the pest properly, and they can integrate the, the pesticide with, with biological control. So the end result then is, a re, is an overall reduction in pesticide use and maintaining that high quality crop that they all want. And Mike Perella has been instrumental in regards to advising us in regards to the identification of the different pests that we have. So we were actually treating them correctly and getting the, the survival rates that we need. Pearlstein says they are using 10 times less chemicals than 20 years ago. We do that by understanding the environment. It's more of an integrated thing now, Paul, because before you looked at the insect and just treated it, now we're looking at the environment. Pest management, IPM, is one part of what a grower has to deal with, and it's one part of the overall production process. So in that context, you can't look at IPM or biological control or pesticide application in a vacuum. It's got to be done in terms of how it fits into the entire production uh, system. For Nurserymen's Exchange in Half Moon Bay, using fewer pesticides by having good insects eat bad ones is good for the bottom line because it reduces labor costs. Meanwhile, in Carpinteria, Westland Floral has shifted to biological controls for the same reason. In Mother Nature, the, uh, the beneficial bug will uh, always be the predator of the bad bug, and the bad bug will never become immune to the predator. So it is always going to be something that works for it versus chemical applications. It has been proven in many studies and continuously in our practical applications that if you don't um, uh, rotate your pesticides or have new pesticides available on a regular basis, you will lose the battle. And we have lost the battle numerous times and that's why uh, benef beneficial control has become very popular even though it's costly. One of the most destructive insects that attack Gerberers are leaf miners. Tiny flies that deposit eggs on leaves. If not controlled by parasitic wasps, soft chemicals are used to eliminate hot spots. These sprays do not kill the beneficial insects. Much of the work that Michael Reed has done is improving post-harvest technology. He has devised ways to keep flowers fresh during the long transit runs to stores across the country, such as cooling flowers to nearly 32 degrees, a method to protect flowers from harmful ethylene gas and a computer chip to monitor temperature of flowers during transportation. Embracing cutting edge technology has been critical for California flower producers. UC Davis researchers are optimistic that continued advances like these will keep California's $10 billion industry in peak bloom. Reporting from Davis, I'm Paul Fotenauer.